comes from the book of Ezra. Probably not a well-known uh, book. Uh, we often don't uh, speak on this or study it, but today we are. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 7 and verses 6 through 10. Let us, let us pray. Father, thank you for the uh, opportunity to open your word and to proclaim the truths that are in there. We ask now that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds to hear you speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to begin with this question that you see on the screen. And, and maybe, maybe you've asked this question, maybe, maybe you haven't, but what is my role in God's kingdom? What is my role in God's kingdom? And kind of the companion question, well, how does God accomplish much of what he does here on earth? Well, the interesting thing uh, is that God has chosen to use people. All of us people to work here on earth. So we're going to spend a few weeks looking at this topic, people God uses. And today we start with Ezra. And I said, I've, I've never preached a sermon on Ezra. Because I can't say that now after we get done here. But, uh, but I was led to this narrative to look at this, this very holy and devout man. Now, as we look at the entirety of this, this book here in the Old Testament, there are two major events and they're separated by about 80 years. And, and as we talked last week about the hand of God on the life of Esther, we see God at work again in the life of Ezra. Now just a little background. God has selected the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, all those, all those centuries before. And they were to be his special people. And they were to do his will. And, and his will ultimately was to bring Jesus the Messiah here in our midst. Well, he, uh, as we read in the Old Testament, uh, the descendants of Abraham uh, ended up in Egypt uh, on a good note. But after a few hundred years, it was not so good. And they were slaves. Well, God brings Moses and he leads them out towards the promised land, modern-day Israel. And this was the land God had chosen. And he had chosen the city of Jerusalem within that land to be his special people. And he had, uh, had Solomon build a temple there so the people could worship God. And the idea that... Uh, as time goes on, sin kind of entered their lives, and they kind of forgot about God, and they forgot about keeping His commandments. And so God, in a, in a disciplining action, sends Babylon to defeat and capture Israel. They become bar, part of the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, and and not only did he occupy Israel, but they took many of the people from Israel back to Babylon. Now Nebuchadnezzar died, and then Persia overtakes Babylon. And then a new king comes on, Cyrus. 
And Cyrus was then the king of kind of this big empire in the Middle East. Now, in the very beginning of this book, we find that God is at work through Cyrus. Now, Cyrus is an interesting king because all the people that he dominated, he showed mercy to. Now, this is noteworthy because Cyrus is not a Jew. But he was the king of the conquering nation, but God was working through him. Just like we see uh, God working through Caesar Augustus in the Roman Empire to get Mary and Joseph from, Beth, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem for Jesus to be born in the prophesied town of Bethlehem. So Cyrus was going to allow one of the exiles, Zerubbabel, aren't you glad we don't use those names today, to lead a group back to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple because when the, when the uh, conquerors came, they destroyed the temple and they destroyed the walls. And, and Cyrus ordered that these people be given resources. And he even gave them back some of the devoted and treasured things from the temple to take back with them. So Zerubbabel, uh, God was working through him. He led this very large delegation back to Jerusalem, and they began rebuilding the temple. And they, they did so with great reverence. And in chapter 3 of Ezra, we find that they begin to lay the foundation for the temple. And when it was completed, the Bible says many of them wept. I mean, this was an emotional event, the temples being rebuilt. Many of them shouted with joy, but every one of them worshipped the Lord. Well, the enemies of Israel began to take notice and they started to intervene. They tried intimidation. Well, that didn't work. Then they tried to tell King Cyrus uh, lies about what was going on. They told him, you know, if you allow them to continue to do this, they're going to break away from the Persian Empire. He believed them, and he ordered the building to stop. A few years pass, new king comes on, King Darius. Now the leaders of the Jews thought, okay, new king will send word back to him to say that we're just rebuilding the temple. We're not trying to have an uprising. And actually, if you check the records, King Cyrus told us to go do this. Check it out. And he did. And he believed them, and the building was started again. Now a few years pass, and along comes this, this King Darius, and um, he, he orders them to be uh, back at work. Well, 80 years pass, the scene now shifts to Ezra, the author of this book, and as we read in our text, God was working through Ezra. Well, the Persian king, as we read, Artaxerxes, sends uh, Ezra back to Jerusalem to do, of all things, to restore the religious life of the people. He's, he's uh, concerned, which is kind of interesting, that this pagan king is concerned about the religious life of a conquered people, but that's what he did. So God's intention was to do this, and he put it in this pagan king to organize this mission. So, so God is working through three pagan kings to do his will. But now we shift to Ezra. And God had put it in Ezra's heart to study God's law and to live it out and to teach others. Well, the first thing he finds when he goes there is that a lot of these people had intermarried with some of the pagans who lived around there. And God had told them not to do this. At, because the problem is this leads to them adopting these pagan practices, basically idolatry, which breaks the first and second commandments. Now, Ezra comes here and he sees this and he goes into mourning. He tore his clothes. He began to fast. He even pulled hair from his head and beard. And then he prayed to God on their behalf. Ezra was broken hearted. And, and the only thing he knew to do was to pray on behalf of the people. So we turn to chapter 9. Now there's a lot of words up there, but I wanted us to get a sense of this prayer. I think this was an important prayer. 
he was heartbroken and he says in, in the beginning, I'm too ashamed and disgraced to even lift my face up to you, God. Because our sins are higher than our heads and her guilt has reached to the heavens. They were in this predicament because of their sin. They were in this, God was disciplining Israel to wake them up. And here's Ezra. You look through that prayer. I mean, here's the thing. Ezra had done none of this. He was, he was a guiltless person praying a prayer for the guilty. He was praying on behalf and in place of the people. Have, have we ever prayed for our nation to pray on behalf of the United States? Ezra had not committed these sins, but was praying as if he had. <clears throat> Jesus died for the sins he hadn't committed, but died as if he had. Ezra acknowledges all this calamity and all these problems have come upon them because of their sin. And he, and he begs for God's mercy and grace to be given to them. He's pleading with God on behalf of these guilty people. You know, there in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there are many examples of people who pray like this. Pray on behalf of the people. They're beseeching God on behalf of the nation for God to be at work. The people who were there began to weep for their sin. They saw this anguish that was, that was brought on to Ezra, and it touched them. I mean, think how Jesus feels when he looks at us, when he looks at our nation. What he went through to redeem us from our sin, and we live this way. He prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And I, he prayed that prayer for us as well. So what was the result of Ezra's prayer? You know, we often say, I'm sorry, don't we? Don't we say, I'm sorry? And sometimes it's, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> the, the little boy his mom caught him with his hand in the cookie jar. And she said, don't let me catch you doing that again. He goes, okay. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> you won't catch me doing that again. I'll still do it, but you won't catch me doing it. So saying we're sorry is one thing. But do our actions reflect something else like I'm sorry I got caught I'll try to be more careful next time <clears throat> saying we're sorry and meaning it how do we know well the word repentance uh, in the New Testament the word means thinking differently afterwards Basically, repentance should lead to a change in thinking and actions. The Bible calls us to repent, to start thinking differently, to start acting differently. Now, what's interesting in this, in this narrative, the men were so convicted about having married these pagan wives, they vowed to send them away along with the children. Now, that's pretty drastic, isn't it? Now, this had nothing to do with racism. This was a spiritual matter. This was repentance in a very real and powerful way. When we repent, our actions should reveal that we are truly sorry and want to change and then begin the process of change. Now, before we, I don't know, to say this this way, I mean, does it, I'm not trying to minimize the situation, but before we think this was a widespread thing, it, evidently there were 113 families out of 29,000 that this affected. 
So only 113 out of 29,000. Well, that doesn't seem too bad. But the effect was profound. That they were willing to do this. Now, it seems harsh, doesn't it? But God, when he calls us to repent, it's, it's a harsh thing. Yes, we are to confess our sin to God, but true repentance, which is what God calls for, God calls us to repent, does not end with what could be lip service. I'm sorry, God, or I'm sorry to the other person. Repentance must lead to corrected behavior and changed attitudes. That's repentance. And that's what every one of us is called to do. So God was working through Ezra to point out, you know, the prophets of the Old Testament were pointing out the sins of Israel. And it was to wake them up. Now, we are able to repent because Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. And that is, that is a freeing thing because it frees us to then be truly sorry. You know, sometimes we apologize to people, but they really haven't forgiven us. They, they want to keep that noose around our necks, if you will. But Jesus dying on the cross truly sets us free. He paid the price so that we can become the people that God uses. See, that's the whole thing. If we're bound up with sin, we can't do the things God wants us to do. And so Jesus comes to set us free from that so that we can live into a new reality, so that we can do a 180. We can do a mind transformation that frees us from the guilt of the past. That's what repentance is. So if we come back to what does it mean to be a person God uses? So I want to give us four things here. To be a person God uses, we must be willing to be willing. To be willing to be willing, which basically says we must be moldable, like the image in the background there of the potter shaping the pot. God uses that, especially in Jeremiah, to talk about him being the potter. And he wants to shape us. Shape us into something usable for him. So we must be willing to be willing. Now, that opens up for God a lot of opportunities, doesn't it? D did Ezra want to go back to Jerusalem? Well, it doesn't say. But he was willing to do that. The next thing is we must be intentional to looking for God at work around us. You know, last week we talked about God incidences. In his book, uh, Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby says, God is always at work around us. We don't have to think up anything. God's already stirring in some of the hearts of some of the people probably in this community. And he's going to open our eyes one day and he'll say, go talk to them. Or, or I want you to do this. I want you to intervene at work. I want you to do whatever it is. God's at work around us, always. We don't, we're not thinking up anything original. We're, we're looking where God is. And he'll, he'll use us. We must remain connected to God. And we can do that through daily Bible study. We can have daily communication with God, prayer. We, we remain an active part of Christ's body, the church. And probably the most important thing is we must submit to Jesus Christ. We must be followers of Jesus because 
to be his disciples will mean that we're willing to be willing, we're looking for what God is doing, we are connected to God, and then he can say, okay, I want you to do this. Or I want you to be available to do that. Have you ever had those moments where you, you feel led to, to talk to somebody? Uh, they'll happen all the time if we're willing to be used by God. So again, all of this is only possible because of Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection. He, he, he did that so that we could live the life we were created to live. So I guess here's the question. Here's the challenge question. Will you be a person God uses? Not just on Sunday, but every day. There are opportunities every day for us to be used by God. So you may be asking, well, how and where will God use me? And I'm glad you asked that. Because I don't know. <laughs> but God does. See, it's God's directive, not your pastor's. You know, I can think of a lot of stuff for you guys to do. <laughs> but God's the one who matters. And rest assured, he wants to use us. He wants all of us to be available. And more than likely, it's going to be starting this afternoon or tomorrow, this next week. He will use us often in everyday situations. Situations where people need to know and experience his love. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, God in human skin. The church, the body of Christ, Christ in human skin. We are to make real the God's love for us, and ultimately to help others meet Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for challenging us today through the life of Ezra as a person you used. So may we see ourselves as vessels through which you can work. So help us now as we go forth to be the church, to spread the good news that your love is real and made real through Jesus. So help us, give us strength. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.